I'm in for $13,000 in this massive 5, 10, 20 PLO game, stuck 7,000, when all of a sudden I find myself in a three-way all-in $18,000 pot. Let's rewind this a bit and figure out exactly how we got here. Good afternoon. It is almost 3.30 on Thursday. Oh yeah, we're catching up on sleep. Plan for today was to play some pot limit Omaha. My wife's able to pick up Charlie, which means that I can stay later at the casino. As a result, I decided to just, uh, after dropping Charlie off, catch up on rest, because there hasn't been much, and then just go in a little bit later so I can be there for the start of the PLO game. If it's not good, then I might just end up playing uh, the 3-5 game. We'll see how it goes. Since my wife's going to need the car to go pick up Charlie, we're going to Uber it to the casino. One of the best parts of living in San Francisco is having this uh, luxury. There are a lot of them, and Uber Pool is relatively cheap. Despite the casino being like a 25 to 30 minute drive away, I think Uber Pool is like 10 bucks or something of that nature, so it's awesome. All right, let's get to it. Waiting outside for the Uber. It is beautiful out. A little windy, but beautiful. Just finished like an eight, nine hour session of 5, 10, 20 PLO. And this one, this one's gonna be a doozy as well. <laughs> there are lots of recounts. Uh, what I can say is it's either been the biggest winning day of my life or the biggest losing day of my life. You're gonna have to tune in until the end to see which one it is. I wonder, we'll see how, what do you think of my poker face? Is it, is it the best day or the worst day ever? I think I'm gonna wait till tomorrow to go over the hands. Unfortunately, I'm just too tired. Uh, I gotta take an Uber pool back home. And so this is gonna have to be it for now. Uh, I'm gonna be a bit delayed on the daily vlogs, but such is life when you're putting in late night PLO sessions. Let's get down to the dirty business of some hands. There's a early position open while playing 510 PLO to 40. I'm in the small blind with Queen, Jack, 10, 9, with, uh, I think it was the Jack, 10, 9 of spades. I like to 3-bet. Out of position, it's probably best, I think, just to flat here, um, because obviously there are going to be a number of boards that I miss on, and being out of position against a middle, early position opener isn't going to be so easy. But uh, it's somebody that's kind of new to PLO. I decided to take an aggressive action. I pot 130, folds to him, and he calls. The flop is ace-king-deuce with two spades, so I end up flopping a royal draw and uh, a bottom rat. Obviously at this point I want to be representing uh, possibly top set of aces, a set of kings. If he ends up having ace-king himself, chances are he isn't going to fold, but this board tends to hit me way stronger than it is him considering that he just flatted pre-flop. I lead 220 into 260, and he rips it for 750 more. Uh, Feels like it's obviously a really easy call. I'm getting great odds. I have the wrap and I have the flush draw, but what sucks is it, it, I, I feel like if he is jamming here, he must obviously either have a set of kings or possibly the queen eye flush draw himself, which makes my hand significantly worse. Considering uh, the odds that I'm getting, there's just no way that I'm folding for $750. So I call and it runs out an offsuit five and an offsuit eight. And he ends up having ace, 10, 10, deuce and I'm not even entirely sure if he had a suit. You see, I hate his call here pre-flop. His hand just does really awful against a three betting range, even in position. He's essentially is trying to flop 
uh, set of tens, and if he doesn't flop a set, like if the flop comes possibly like ace, four, eight, I don't know entirely sure, like what is he doing? Is he trying to get, you know, just all the stack in here post-flop? Um, unfortunately, I end up doubling him up for $1,000, so pretty much right off the bat, we find ourselves stuck $1,000. Pretty early on in the session, we decided to just start straddling. So essentially for the entirety of the nine hours that I played, we were playing 5, 10, 20 PLO. It's generally a 5, 10 PLO game, but oftentimes it'll run as a 5, 10, 20 with automatic straddles. Early position opens to 80, and I'm to his immediate left. This is a fairly novice player and probably the weakest spot in the game. I have king, king, queen, eight with two spades. Obviously, I can 3-bet to isolate here, but uh, I like to just call in position and play a pot. We end up going heads up to a flop of Jack-9-3 with two clubs. He checks. When I flop an over pair here, uh, a backdoor flush draw, and the gut shot to the nuts, I'm going to be betting. I bet 120, and he check calls. The turn is an offsuit 6, and he checks again. I'm going to be double barreling here. I think, A, I'm going to have a, the best hand a large percentage of time. He could possibly have flush draws. Similarly, because he's new to the game, I think he's going to be kind of possibly tight passive and folding possibly better hands than mine, like aces. I think if I double barrel here, he's going to have a hard time calling with aces. So he checks, and I bet 320, and he calls fairly quickly. The river is an offsuit deuce, and he checks again. It's a terrible card for this run out as far as me bluffing him off of aces. A lot of draws have missed. So I think if he checks and I do decide to bomb it, I'm not entirely sure that he's going to fold aces or possibly like two pair. Uh, what I ended up finding out later was it seemed like what he did was try to play tight passive and in situations where he had like bottom set or something like that, he was just check calling down, which I think is the appropriate approach for someone uh, of his caliber because you know you don't want to end up getting yourself in these massive pots with bottom set where really the only hand that's calling you is a better set or some monster draw. So once he checks, I go into the tank, I think about uh, turning my hand into a bluff, but feel like he's just not folding on this round if he does have me beat. So I check it back, and I end up beating his queen jack 10-10. So he flopped uh, a jack uh, top pair, as well as an open ender. I understand why he's calling two barrels here. If I'm him, I think about possibly folding the turn, because really he's not ahead of much. I could have his queen jack 10 in really bad shape here, uh, especially if I happen to be free rolling. Um, for clubs or possibly just have a better jack. It folds to me in the cutoff and I have king king 7-5 no suits. I open to 80. The player to my immediate left calls and the straddler calls as well and we go three ways to a flop of king 9-9. Nine, nine. I flop top boat. Straddler checks. I bet 100. The guy behind me folds and now the straddler calls. Um, I'm not entirely sure that I love this bet. Obviously I should be checking. I think A to induce. B to get uh, possibly under pairs like a queen or a jack to make worse sets for free on the turn. Like for example, if somebody has pocket queens and the turn's a queen, now I get to make money off of them. Um, at the same time, I do want to be getting some value from nines um, by checking this flop and then trying to put in a bunch of money later on later streets. It's going to be fairly obvious that I have pocket kings. The player in the straddle who does call is a bit of an oddity. He's fairly tight, but at the same time, sometimes you can just have a screw loose. He's done really weird things where he'll limp pocket kings in no limit and goes multi-way and the flop comes ace high and just open folds them face up because he gets disgruntled a lot. So when he calls me here, I think his range is strictly a nine, quad nines, um, and that's about it really. Possibly pocket aces, like bad aces if he flats those pre, and then on this flop is just going to be calling. The turn is a seven and he checks. There is a decent percentage of the time where I'm gonna check back here, A to induce, B to protect myself against quads. We are fairly deep and I don't want to just double them up. Like if I bet here, I think like there's just not many hands that I'm going to stack here that aren't exactly like king nine. So by checking back, A, allow him to catch up sometimes, B, allow him to value bet, and C, just disguise the strength of my hand. I decide at the moment that I'm stuck, I don't want to be nitty. It's a little silly to be checking back here to essentially be protecting myself against quads. I bet 160 and he calls. The river is an ace. And now he leads into me for 300. I don't love it because, like I said, I think there's a decent percentage of the time in here where he is flatting me pre with aces and calling down. Uh, when the river is an ace, I think really the worst hand that he's going to have, at least specifically this opponent, is exactly ace nine. So I'm essentially just hoping that he is leading ace nine. Um, I obviously can't raise for value because I don't think he's ever calling me with worse. I'm going to have pocket kings and aces here a lot of the time. And essentially, I'm just going to run into it if he does have pocket nines. 
Maybe I can raise small for value, but I, I just don't love that situation. I actually feel really bad uh, in this spot. I want to fold. Like, I feel like I'm beat, but I've said before, it's really silly to be trying to make these hero folds. Given his small sizing, I think he could be leading here for this sizing with ace-9, possibly 9-7, maybe even king-9, to essentially name his price and not want me to bet a larger sizing. I call, sure enough, he has pocket nines for quad nines. I guess I could have saved a little bit of money here if I checked back the turn, um, because now when he leads the river, you know, I, I it's probably going to be a smaller sizing. Um, as played, I, I don't think there's really much I can do here. Obviously, a hand essentially plays itself. It's been a while since I flopped top boat and ran into quads, so uh, I guess I was due for a cooler like this. In this next hand, the same player who flopped quad nines limps for 20, folds to me in a small blind, I limp for 20 with 10, 8, 8, 6, double suited. And now the player to my immediate left, um, who is another player who I think is a bit of a novice to the game, he pots it to 95. Uh, the other player who had limped calls, and I like to call as well. I think this is just a little bit too light. Obviously at this point I think I'm stuck a fair amount, maybe two, three thousand dollars. I don't want to be folding. Both of these players are players I want to be playing pots with. Uh, so that's the reason I call, but I think essentially out of position here, this is a clear fold with 10 8 8 6 double suited. I'm going to find myself in a lot of situations where I'm going to have a flush draw that is going to be over flushed. And uh, you know, if I do flop like a straight draw or something like that, I am out of position, so it just doesn't play that well. The flop is king 9 7 rainbow, so I flop uh, basically a wrap straight draw and two backdoor flush draws. I check. The pre-flop potter bets now 200 into what is about like 285, something like that. The limper folds, uh, the person that I bet at this point 200 is playing, I think, about like 900. I've seen him uh, bet fold a lot, so I think on this board, barring him not having like top set uh, or maybe flop top two, I think he might fold a decent percentage of the time. Uh, obviously, my hand has a lot of equity essentially against everything except, you know, top set. And even against that, I have two backdoor flush draws, so I'm in good shape. I pot, uh, putting him almost all in, and uh, he, we're counting it for a second, and he's just like, you know what, I'm all in. I call. We get it in for 885 on the flop. He ends up having king, king, nine, five uh, for top set and uh, blocking his own boat blocker with the nine. The turn is a six of diamonds, so I make a straight, uh, the nut straight, and I also pick up a flush draw. The river is a four of diamonds. I actually, for whatever reason, maybe I was tired, hadn't immediately realized that I turned a straight. And so when he tables his hand, he's just like, do you have diamonds? Uh, and, I, and the first thing that I go to check for is if I did have diamonds as opposed to the straight, which I also have. Uh, as I go to look for my, uh, my cards to see if I do have diamonds, which I did, as I'm realizing, I'm like, yeah, I think I do have diamonds. Somebody else goes, don't worry about it. He's got them. So he ends up having king five of diamonds and back during the flush after flopping top set. So that's obviously pretty frustrating, especially once I turn the hand. I think we were about 50-50 on the flop, and once the turn comes, I'm about a 68% favorite. Just running bad in these close spots, obviously, uh, just nothing's going my way, getting in a lot of these flips, and haven't won one yet. At this point, I think I'm stuck around four or 5,000. After a couple of limpers, I limp the button with ace-4, 9-7, the ace-4 of hearts, 9-7 of spades, uh, the small blind limps, the big blind limps, and now the straddler, who's a friend of mine, pots it to 140, folds to me. Uh, I think this is a spot where I can obviously be folding. My hand just isn't that excellent. Um, I am in position, so that is nice. Obviously, I'm stuck. I want to be playing hands. And post-flop, I think my hand is going to play fairly well in position. I'm either going to flop a high-equity hand or be able to outplay my friend who I think is going to be in a tough spot here um, out of position. I call, and now the small blind calls as well. The flop is 8-jack-10 rainbow, so I flop the second nuts. And now the small blind ends up just open jamming like 580. My friend folds. The pot is obviously smaller than this, but at this point, essentially, if I am calling, we're getting it all in. Um, I look at you know the, the stack, trying to count it down. I think this is essentially a snap call. I, I kind of put on a little bit of a show because I just I was running so bad that I'm like, God, you know, she's gonna end up having queen nine here, and I'm essentially dead. Uh, then I start thinking about it, and I'm like, you know, obviously she could have a lot of sets here. Uh, similarly, like a set and a straight draw, like uh, Jack Jack King Queen. She can also end up having a hand like Jack-10 Queen. Uh, there's just a lot of hands like two pair plus straight draw that uh, I'm ahead of. Uh, for the sizing, I'm just not folding. So we get it in. I also have two backdoor flush draws just in case she did flop uh, the nuts. So I have some equity in that situation that I'm not completely dead. 
The turn is the six of diamonds, and the river is the king of diamonds for a backdoor flush. Not the backdoor flush I have. And she tables ace, queen, jack, ten. I'm looking at her hand. Flop, top, two pair, and a gutter. She drills the gut shot for the king uh, to, to make the nut straight. Pretty frustrating again, um, you know, getting it in with the best of it. Not like a hand that's, you know, dead, but at the same time, you know, I am ahead again. So, pretty frustrating. And I think at this point, I find myself stuck around like 5,500, 6,000, something like that. I'm under the gun with ace, ace, four, deuce, nut hearts, and I open to 80. The player to my left, who's been short stacking essentially all day, has been stacked a number of times, now pots it to 280. Folds to the small blind, who is an action player, pretty much the, the largest action player at the casino. The game is often built around him. He had been uh, at the casino for a while in the must move game, and now he just finally made his way into our game. I'm not sure entirely if he was trying to put the player who potted me pre flop all in, or if he himself was trying to pot. Uh, the kid was playing about 420, so he puts in 420, which isn't enough for a raise. Uh, so he kind of laughs. The dealer tells him it's just a call. At this point, I potted myself to 1150. The kid to my immediate left calls, and it folds back to the action player. He's not folding pretty much any single hand that he ever has here, so he calls. The flop is King Jack 3 with two diamonds. Obviously, an awful flop for me. A lot of times here, he's going to have uh, some Broadway hands that either flop a pair in an open ended, uh, possibly a set of kings, set of jacks. Uh, really anything. It's just impossible to put him on a hand here. Obviously also when there's a flush draw that I don't have, he can possibly have it. Uh, when he checks, I like to check back. This is a player that I'd mentioned previously playing a big hand with where I think he generally plays his hand straightforward. So I can check back here and play I think almost perfectly on a variety of runouts. I think if he ends up leading into me, I could just fold. The turn is at 10 and he checks, I check back. Another awful card for me that I think is going to be hitting a lot. He also could have just some random hand here like King, Deuce, Five, Six, pretty much like any four cards. So I could be ahead of uh, some of his really random hands. Could be betting for value to protect my hand, but uh, again, I don't love it. I'm not going to be betting here trying to get him to fold. The pot is massive, so if I bet, I think he's just going to be calling me with better. Obviously, I could protect my equity here by betting, um, but we're deep. I don't want to get myself in just a super tricky six spot, so I check it back. The river is an offsuit three, and now he bets 600 and a 2700, so the pot is about 3300. I'm getting over uh, over five to one on the call. When he bets here, I think it's pretty easy to exploitatively just fold because, like I said, he doesn't bluff a lot. At the same time, I'm a little worried that maybe he has a hand like King Jack and isn't aware that like his two pair is losing the aces. It's a really small bet. I only have to be right like 18% of the time. I think he's, I, I think I probably have the best hand maybe like 10% of the time, so it's a losing call. But I'm stuck too much. Pot's too huge. I'm not folding. He ends up having Ace King Eight Three for flopping top and bottom. Obviously, if I bet, he's not folding. He's not going anywhere. And by the river, he makes a boat. Just sucks running really bad. Uh, obviously, I have a hand like Ace King Eight Three in really bad shape when I have aces, um, and and he has no suits. But uh, it's it's been going this way all day. And now, what you've all been waiting for, the pot of the night. Playing five ten twenty, the action player limps. I had been isolating him a quite a fair bit amount. Uh, obviously, all of the times that I was doing this, I was doing it with good hands, going multi way in PLO as we often are, it's going to be tough, so I don't really want to be isolating him with bad hands. That is clearly not the play. Uh, I end up having 8, 9, 10 jack with the jack 9 of clubs, so I isolate to 100. Uh, as is the case, everyone's trying to play pots with him. Small blind calls, I think the big blind calls, uh, and now he pots it to 600. Uh, I think there's actually one more caller in between, so he pots it to 600. We're playing, I think, he's playing around... 6,000, I think I'm playing like 6,800, uh, something close to there. I'm obviously never folding here in position with a hand as good as 8, 9, 10 jack. I thought about re-raising to isolate, but my hand plays just really well post-flop. I'm in position, so I can just realize my equity post-flop. I don't expect any of the blinds to repot here and put me in a bad situation. Uh, so I decided to just call 500 and play a pot deep in position. Now the small blind, who's a buddy of mine, goes into the tank and ends up repotting to isolate. Really gross. 
very frustrating that I called the 600 here. Now the action player, who I think generally in this spot might just jam it in, and that is what I think my friend was expecting. He was looking to get it heads up against the action player's pretty wide range. The action player hadn't been doing anything too crazy at this point. He had made a joke early on where he was saying how he had to make his money last three hours, meaning that most likely he had a deadline by which he wanted to leave, maybe midnight, something like that. And he wanted to ensure that the four or $5,000 stack that he had lasted him long enough. Uh, so he wasn't playing too wild. So I think when he limp re-raises here, he's actually in a pretty fairly strong range. I hadn't seen him really do this yet. So it's now on him and he decides to flat uh, 2,000 more. I'm stuck a guap. I think my hand is gonna play fairly well post flop here in position. I think when I open to 100 here, my friend might be repotting aces. Uh, it's possible that he doesn't repot because he wants to allow the action player in there and can re-isolate. And even if he does have aces, my hand plays really well against aces, so I don't mind that. I think he's just more likely to have a hand like possibly pocket kings or maybe a hand like ace, king, queen uh, that is looking to isolate against what he believes is a fairly wide range against the action player. As I mentioned, stuck a bunch. I don't love this call, but I'm not folding. I'm here to gamble. I'm not going to get unstuck by uh, folding hands like this. So I call 2000 and at this point we're finding ourselves in a massive pot. Uh, a lot of the casino starts encircling the table because of the fact that we're playing this giant pot. So we go three ways to a flop for a pot, I think that's of about $8,000. The flop comes 873 with the 73 of diamonds. The small blind, my buddy, tank, jams it in there. Now the action player calls it off, I guess fairly quickly. I had been standing up because essentially I'm just getting it always all in uh, if I flop any equity. So I wasn't paying attention to the action player behind me. Uh, essentially I figured if I flop anything, I'm just calling it off anyway. So I thought it took him a little bit of a, a time to call. Uh, it turns out I guess other people had said he had called fairly quickly. So I'm standing up, kind of sweating the board, uh, end up checking out one card at a time just to give myself the ultimate sweat in this massive pot. Once I see that I flop top pair and the wrap, there's nowhere that I'm going. I call it off, and now we can roll the tape as to what exactly happens. Main pot is square. Yes, 26. Oh. That is straight. That is straight. Nice set. Side pots first. Let me count your stack. So it ends up running off, uh, I think, the deuce of diamonds and then the six of diamonds. So I make the nuts straight. There is a side pot. I have an extra, I think, like 850 over the action player. Uh, so no one's really doing anything immediately. So I feel like there's just a sense that I had that my friend didn't have a flush. Because it came diamond, diamond, I have a diamond in my hand. I thought it was possible that nobody has a flush. So I roll my hand pretty confidently saying I have a straight. My buddy kind of shakes his head, ends up mucking his hand for the side pot. And then shortly thereafter, as we can see in the video, the action player rolls over the nut flush for the main pot. It's a really gross spot. Uh, nothing that I can do once, uh, once I call here. I do have a screenshot of the equities for our hands pre-flop as well as post-flop, so I'll show those here. As you can see, we're all pretty pretty close and fairly even pre-flop, essentially just gambling for tons of money. And then post-flop, uh, I have the largest amount of equity. I end up actually flopping the best hand with a pair of eights, as sick as that is. Looking at my friend's hand, what we do see is kind of essentially exactly what I thought was going on. He was just uh, uh, isolating the action player. I don't really love his play because I think the action player had been playing fairly snug and could end up having a hand like ace, king, queen, jack here, possibly even aces. Um, but I guess he just figured that the action player is going to have a very wide range. He ended up being right that the action player did have a really wide range to be getting it, to be uh, limp 
potting here with ace 10 4 4 one suit post flop once he flops a seven there's really not much he can do uh since he did flop a pair he doesn't love it obviously but out of position against three players i think just open ripping here is fine obviously he ends up being in pretty bad shape if i'm him i i i, I don't isolate here also because i flat in position i think i myself can have a hand like ace king queen jack ace queen jack 10 things of that nature one suit that isn't looking to repot against the action player, even though possibly I should be, because I, th I thought that the action player could have a hand like aces, or just a very strong hand. So I don't wanna just get in like $6,000 pre-flop against what could be a very strong range. This was essentially all I was playing at that point, and if I did go broke, uh, that was gonna be the end of it. I just didn't wanna gamble for all the money. So I don't really love my friend's play. Obviously he thought that when he isolates here, the uh, action player might re-isolate. I'm going to fold a ton. And even if the action player doesn't re-isolate, I'm just going to fold a lot for 2000 extra. He finds himself in a gross spot post-flop. So I guess there's just not much that we can all really do. The hands play itself once that flop comes. And really, that's that's all she wrote. Uh, after that hand, I end up winning the side pot, which I think was around 16 or 1700 Pretty gross. I'm in for 13000 Stuck about uh, 11500 And... <laughs> just miserable. Uh, this is like the most I've ever been stuck by a wide margin, possibly by like double. Um, obviously, I'm not leaving the game's action. It's a ton of gamble. So at this point with $1,600 stack, I'm essentially just gambling. In an action-packed game, I'm not leaving. I'm going to try to run up the $1,600 stack. Lucky for me, I did end up running up the $1,600 to about $4,800, uh, maybe about $5,000 at its peak. Uh, before uh, the action player had left and the game had essentially dried up to what I thought was mostly good players And so I just decided to leave with about I think 4800 feels good to run up the 1600 back to 4800 Obviously still feels awful to lose about 8150 which is what I ended up losing for the night looking back on the entire situation Once the action player had gotten in the game the game was great obviously a ton of gamble uh, I think these stakes are probably a bit larger than I want to be playing, uh, mostly for the reason as something that Garrett Adelstein had mentioned in his podcast, that it really sucks when your normal game is something of medium stakes, and you can only play fairly large stakes a few times a year. Since I do have to watch Charlie, these stakes of 5, 10, 20, I generally run at night, and I can't play them regularly, so it really sucks when you run bad in essentially the largest game that you can play, and... Uh, could only play it maybe like a handful of times, maximum 20 times a year. Unfortunate, hurts, um, you know, a bit of a life lesson at the same time. Losing large sums of money to this to this uh, amount uh, kind of shows you what you're made of. It didn't end up feeling as bad as I thought it would. Even the next day, I'm, I'm kind of okay with it. I've been running fairly good for this vlog in the last 10 days. Essentially gave it all back in this uh, this game, so that does suck. But, uh, you know, it's building mental fortitude. These are the situations and, and sessions that are going to teach me exactly what I'm made of. I'm proud of myself to be able to play well uh, from that $1,600 stack. Um, after that, I started making some hands, but I also played well. There's one hand that sticks out in my mind particularly. I have Ace-10-10-5 10, 10, with uh, the Ace of Clubs in the big blind, in the limp pot. The flop comes 10-8-3 with two clubs. So I flop top set. I lead into the field for pot. The player to my left, who's again short stacking calls, and now the action player in the small blind calls as well. The turn is the queen of clubs, which is obviously essentially the worst card in the deck. The flush gets there, the straight draw gets there. Uh, the action player checks, I check, and now the short stacker to my left bets 100, which is a really small bet into this pot of, I think, about 320. He's got like 180 left, and it feels a lot like, to me, like he's bet folding. Um, I think that because he's in for numerous $400 bullets, He's looking to save this money if he does feel like he's beat. The action player calls, and once I realize that I have the ace of clubs, I decide that this is a great spot to check raise. Um, I'm going to have equity against the player to my left no matter what with a set, and if I can get him to fold, now um, I'm representing uh, for a deep stack uh, against the action player with uh, for the nuts with the ace of clubs. So I make it 300 and sure enough, the player to my left folds fairly quickly, what I assume is probably like a middling flush. Maybe I have the best hand with a set, but it seems very unlikely. The action player calls, and the river is a brick. He checks, and I have to go for it. There's just nothing I can really do here. I'm repping the nuts. Uh, there's a chance that I have a best hand with a set against like maybe his worst two pair, but I think sometimes he's gonna show up here with a flush. 
I bet 800 and he folds. So I felt really good about that. It's possible that I had both of them beat on the turn, but I think that's very unlikely. So by playing my hand in this manner, I was able to uh, get both of them to fold. I end up leaving him with about 5,000, uh, an 8,000 dollar loser. And looking upon the situation, I think going forward, I'm just not too interested in playing uh, Pot Limit Omaha at this casino. The game really wasn't that great for most of the session. What used to be just an excellent action-packed game with players who didn't really know what they're doing has mostly turned into either pros or players who are nut pedaling, you know, trying to make big hands and get the money in. And that's just not the type of PLO I want to be playing. I think my edge in No Limit Hold'em is going to be way larger where I can outplay players. As I said, the game is fairly large. I can't play it regularly. It's too frustrating to be playing high stakes and allowing for the, the variance to make up much of my year. So I think unless I find myself in a situation where the game looks really good and I have the opportunity to play, I'm just not going to be going out of my way to head back to the casino at nighttime to put in a PLO session where the game just really doesn't seem to be that great on a regular basis. That's it pretty much for the evening. It is Friday around noon. I'm going to be editing this up, hopefully have it up by tonight. I think what I'm actually going to do is head to the casino to put in a session that I can edit over the weekend to update. And then while I'm playing, I can hopefully edit out these uh, videos to put out the content for tonight. So kind of kill two birds with one stone. You know, <laughs> barring the, uh, the ultimate brutality of losing like 12,000, uh, I feel pretty good about it. I, I made a decent comeback. Uh, looking for my low point, I won back over $3,000, which is great. Sucks to have been stuck nearly 12,000, but uh, you know, in, in, in poker, that's gonna happen. Going forward, when I get stuck multiple bullets, it's just not gonna feel as painful uh, in relation to these stakes. So I think, uh, I feel great about myself that I was able to still play well afterwards. Obviously, I put myself in some tricky situations, gambling spots that I didn't need to, but I'm okay with that. Uh, it is pot limit Omaha, that's gonna happen. Uh, all right, thanks guys for checking this out. Appreciate it, and uh, we'll catch you later. Bye.